One economist, Mesro Financial's Diane Swank, calls the report good news, but she says it's not enough to erase the risk of recession, especially, she says, if the situation in Europe worsens. Diane joins us now from Chicago. Diane, thank you for joining us on In Business. Uh, let's dig right into the data right away because the headline number was encouraging. The jobless rate stayed at 9.1 percent. But when you look at a couple of the factors in there, manufacturing payrolls actually shrank for a second month. And this was the strongest part of the economy. Isn't that a bad sign? That's something I'm very concerned about. We also saw an increase of construction jobs of 26,000, which is clearly unsustainable given our current home building bust that we have going on right now. And so to not see the manufacturing jobs come back, especially when we are seeing some of the um, transitory things from Japan play out and the vehicle sector starting to see some increases, you do start to worry. Remember in the most recent manufacturing ISM, we saw the back auto orders had shrunk, and that was bad news too, even though the overall number was up. And we're worrying about what's going on in China, what's going on in emerging markets, and how our export markets have been holding up. That's something to be concerned about going forward. So although I welcome these numbers, they're better than they were, they're still, you know, we've lowered our threshold so low on what's acceptable now. Um, this still isn't enough to really bring down the unemployment rate or get us where we need to go in terms of out of that risk of recession territory. Right. We, seems to, we seem to have averted recession for now, but recession by definition is two quarters of negative growth or shrinkage in the economy. What kind of number what we need to see to confirm there is a recession besides just a negative jobs number. Well, you know, we would need to see a decline in production. That tends to be one of the first things. Also, declining um, uh, consumption, which I think September, the income numbers look good. The preliminary reports, we've got auto sales picking up again. The pent-up demand there, deliveries finally coming in from Japan. So that'll hold us for a while. The real critical issue gets at the beginning of the year when we start dealing with if or we do or do not get an extension of the payroll tax cut and we still have sort of very mediocre jobs numbers at best, that could be a real problem and headwind for um, the first quarter. We also have, you know, the crisis in confidence we have among American business. There's sort of a paralysis out there, even though we have a lot of cash on the sidelines, to actually use that cash to put it to work. And that paralysis is not going to be helped by the, um, if the super committee does not come up with their $1.2 trillion, which right now mm -hmm. it does not look like they will, or if Europe, you know, does have some other blow-up and China's being watched on the horizon. So there's a lot of uncertainty and just even a little bit of vision mm. would help us to get through this period. But right now we have very little. It's a very clouded outlook. So what does this report do in terms of the Federal Reserve um, continuing with stronger easing efforts, something that Ben Bernanke kind of alluded to in his testimony this week? I don't think they'll do anything um, dramatic at the next meeting, but they're still going to be very prepared. This does not change the equation for the Fed. The high unemployment rate, the um, number of people taking part-time pay instead of full-time pay, um, maybe that's a lot of people coming off of their extensions to unemployment insurance and going to work now, um, but they're only going to be adding to the ranks of the working poor. That doesn't change the equation for the Fed in terms of downward pressure down the road on inflation, which they think inflation will come back in a bit. So all of these things. It doesn't really change the equation dramatically for the Fed. I think they're on a bit of a hold at this next meeting as they try to figure out what next to do. Mm -hmm. um, but they are talking about some fairly dramatic things about what next to do in terms of shaping longer-term consequences to deal with the liquidity trap we're in. We sort of have that sense of, you know, water, water everywhere and right. narrow drop to drink. And, um, you know, that is something the Fed wants to change. And the way to do it is very controversial, which is why you're seeing um, a lot of debate within the Fed about that. Right, certainly. Ben Bernanke got getting a lot of pushback from members of his FOMC. Thanks so much, Diane Swank.